Well, Boa Tarja and Buenas Tardes to everyone. I'd first like to thank the Congress organizers for the invitation to speak at this meeting. I wish that I could be with all of you in person, but I am grateful that technology allows us to connect and to continue to exchange ideas despite the COVID-19 pandemic. So I have been asked to speak on the topic from research to clinical practice in dysphagia, where are we? I'm planning to talk for about 45 minutes and then have time for questions. And I'd like to start by sharing just a bit about my own history as a dysphagia researcher. And then we will look back across the history of dysphagia research to highlight themes and trends that have been dominant at different points in our development. I then want to look at what I call the life cycle of a research question. Here we will explore how our research question begins and what the various options are for steps that can be pursued to answer that question. A key element here, of course, is the link between challenges that we encounter in clinical practice and the research that we then perform to address those challenges. We will then look at different types of studies and their corresponding levels of evidence. And this will lead us very naturally into discussing the task of reviewing the scientific literature. This is an activity that every research student performs, but it is also something that clinicians can learn to do. So I want to spend some time discussing the methodology and in particular, talking about how we can carefully appraise the quality of articles in our literature. I want to share with you then a list of threats that we need to be on the watch for and opportunities that we have for raising the bar and promoting rigor, transparency, and excellence in dysphagia research. And I will close with a list of priorities that I hope will be addressed over the next decade. And finally, I will look forward to your questions and to discussion with Hanata's help as a moderator. But first, let me start with a brief introduction about me and my work. So as you may know, I live in Canada's largest city, the city of Toronto. Toronto is located on the shores of Lake Ontario, and it has a population of about 5.9 million people. And my research lab is located at the Kite Research Institute which is the research arm of the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, and that is Canada's largest rehabilitation hospital and part of the University Health Network, which is Toronto's largest teaching hospital. And here you can see the members of my wonderful lab team, which includes speech language pathologists, postdoctoral fellows, doctoral students, and two engineers. And on this slide, you can see some of the recent doctoral and postdoctoral trainees who have studied in my lab. And if you'll allow me, I thought it might be interesting to share with you how I became a dysphagia researcher. I graduated with my master's degree as a speech language pathologist in 1991. And my first clinical position was as the sole charge speech language pathologist in a 400 bed home for the aged where I worked for three years. And while I was there, my manager encouraged me to consider doing a research project. And I decided to develop a screening checklist to describe the different presentations of mealtime difficulties in residents at that facility. This was mainly intended to help me manage my referrals by directing residents to the right kind of assessment. And this work ultimately led to my first poster presentation at an ASHA convention, and also to my first publication in the dysphagia journal in 1997. Now, a couple of years before the publication, I actually moved to work in an acute care hospital with a focus on dysphagia. And while I was there, I conducted several quality improvement projects, including one project looking at the impact of introducing swallowing assessments into the emergency room. And one of our concerns at that time was the fact that patients might stay for a long time, meaning a couple of days, in the emergency room before they were admitted to an inpatient bed. And we were concerned that this delay in recognizing dysphagia might be contributing to poor outcomes. 
It was also around this time that I started attending conferences and workshops and developing my own questions about best practice. And I began to feel a bit restless and frustrated by the challenges that I was encountering in clinical practice. I absolutely loved doing video fluoroscopy and spending many hours trying to dissect what was wrong with a patient swallowing. But I also felt that after all of that effort, we had very little to offer our patients in terms of treatments other than recommending pureed food and thickened liquids. And so in 1996, I had the opportunity to attend a workshop on dysarthria and motor speech disorders in Detroit, Michigan. And since I was going there, I decided to reach out to Dr. Susan Langmore to see if I might be able to spend a day visiting her in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I had previously heard Dr. Langmore speak at a conference and I was keen to get her advice on the things that were frustrating me as a clinician. Now, Susan not only graciously gave me a full day of her time, but she also encouraged me to attend that year's Dysphagia Research Society meeting. And so in October 1996, I went to my very first DRS meeting in Aspen, Colorado. And people say that your first DRS will always be your most memorable experience, and that was certainly true for me. I was immediately captured by the debate and the dialogue that I watched taking place on the conference floor. And I thought it was amazing that conference attendees could chat with the leaders in the field, such as Dr. Logeman, Dr. Sonnies, and Dr. Grower. And I made many new friends at that meeting who became my colleagues and remain some of my closest friends to this day. I have never missed a DRS meeting since. But if we fast track a couple of years forward from that date, I had become even more frustrated as a clinician. And after attending a really inspiring workshop on surface EMG biofeedback in dysphagia rehabilitation by Dr. Maggie Lee Huckabee, I decided that it was time for me to go back to university and pursue my PhD. At the time, I had young children, and I wasn't able to consider studying at a university outside of Toronto. And the speech-language pathology department at the University of Toronto actually did not have a dysphagia professor at that time. So I joined the lab of Dr. Pascal van Lieshout, a speech scientist who focuses on motor control. And in his lab, I used a method called electromagnetic mid-sagittal articulography to study tongue movements in healthy swallowing. When I completed my PhD in 2003, I was fortunate to receive a junior scientist position at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, and also to get my first research grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And I'm still at Toronto Rehab today. And along the way, I have been fortunate to receive additional grants, to develop close collaborations with scientists, both within speech language pathology and from a variety of other disciplines, to travel the world to speak at conferences like this one, and to work closely with frontline clinicians and patients so that the real challenges of clinical practice remain a strong focus in my program of research. So this then leads me to my disclosures, which are listed on this slide. So that's enough about me, but what about the history of dysphagia research? Of course, in conventional history class, we learn to divide the dates of history into those years that fall before the year zero or after, and we use the annotations BC for before Christ and AD for Anno Domini. And in the dysphagia world, it's probably not too much to say that we could use similar nomenclature to annotate the years before and after 1983 as BL and AL, meaning before Logaman and after Logaman, because it was in 1983 that Dr. Jerry Logaman published her first textbook describing the assessment of swallowing and followed shortly thereafter by the first edition of her manual for the video fluorographic study of swallowing. 
Although there are many leaders who have contributed to the field of dysphagia research, Dr. Logeman is widely regarded as the founder of the field. In the mid to late 1980s, we saw two very important events in the history of dysphagia research, namely the founding of the Dysphagia Journal in 1986 under the editorial leadership of Dr. Bronwyn Jones, and the following year, the founding of the Dysphagia Research Society under the leadership of Dr. Reza Shakir. Now, I know that both Dr. Jones and Dr. Shakir would be quick to acknowledge their own mentors, namely Drs. Martin Donner and Dr. Wiley J. Dodds, both of whom passed away early in the 1990s. And it's worth mentioning here that one of the medical trainees in the lab of Dr. Dodds at the University of Wisconsin at that time was none other than Dr. Roberto Danzas, who was instrumental, of course, in developing the field of dysphagia research in Brazil. Around this time, the dysphagia research literature predominantly included descriptions of assessment protocols and descriptions of the presentations of different types of patients on those exams. And it's interesting for us to realize that some of those same themes remain current today. For example, we have the 1989 publication by Dr. Dantas describing differences in swallowing across high and low density barium preparations. And that's definitely still a question of interest today. Another dysphagia researcher who published extensively starting in the 1980s was radiologist Dr. Ola Ekberg in Sweden, who is still active as a dysphagia clinician and researcher today. And here I'm highlighting one of his papers from 1989, exploring normal sip volume or bolus size, which is another question that we still debate today. And we should also take note of the third author on that paper, Dr. Michael Grower, who has been another force in the history of dysphagia clinical practice and research, and who has mentored many international dysphagia researchers, including Dr. Roberta Gonçalves de Silva. And of course, another leader whose work dates back to this time is Dr. Joan Arvidsson, who has led both research and clinical practice in the area of pediatric feeding and swallowing, such as this paper looking at the characteristics of dysphagia in children with cerebral palsy, yet another topic that remains current today. Now, the problem with putting together a chronology like this is that inevitably one leaves people out or forgets to mention important people. And already I have neglected to mention several really important people who contributed to the development of dysphagia research in the 1980s and early 1990s. And those people include, among others, names like Dr. James Bosma, Dr. Clarence Sasaki, Dr. Don Castell, Dr. Justine Jones Shepherd, Dr. Art Miller, Dr. Adrian Perlman, Dr. Barbara Sunnies, and Dr. Susan Langmore. And the seminal work by these leaders helped us to begin to understand the neurophysiology of swallowing, how to use novel instrumental tools like ultrasound, endoscopy, or manometry, and how to explore connections between oropharyngeal function laryngeal function, and esophageal function. As we moved into the mid-1990s, one can notice a distinct change in the themes of dysphagia research, because it was during this time that we started the conversation about scales for measuring dysphagia, such as Dr. J. Rosenbeck's eight-point penetration aspiration scale. And Dr. Logeman's lab was prolific at this time in publishing studies exploring the impact of compensatory maneuvers on swallowing, including the chin down posture, other postural maneuvers, the Masako maneuver, the super supraglottic swallow, and the effects of stimulation with cold temperature or sour stimuli. In addition to work exploring the impact of compensatory maneuvers, we started to see research emerging regarding the possible longer lasting effects of rehabilitative interventions on swallowing coming from the labs of people like Dr. Michael Creary, Dr. Joanne Robbins, and Dr. Maggie Lee Huckabee. And some of these studies also involved the early use of device facilitated biofeedback. 
1998 was also the year in which Dr. Langmore's landmark study was published, raising questions about the links between dysphagia and aspiration pneumonia. It was also around this time that we saw an explosion of work involving new neuroimaging techniques to understand swallowing neurophysiology and the impact of stroke lesion size, location, and laterality on swallowing, coming from leaders like Dr. Shaheen Hamdi. And as we crossed into the 2000s, this emphasis on dysphagia in stroke coincided with a focus on reliability, diagnostic accuracy, validity, and standardization in clinical bedside and video fluoroscopic swallowing assessments that you can see prominently in the work of Drs. Gary McCullough, Stephanie Daniels, Giselle Carnaby-Mann, and Bonnie Martin-Harris. Continuing into the 2000s, a few other important trends can be seen in dysphagia research, and the timeline starts to get really busy. First, our field was influenced by broader trends in clinical medicine and epidemiology to more carefully review and appraise prior research through systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And my colleague, Dr. Rosemary Martino, has been a leader of this kind of work, beginning with her systematic review regarding the accuracy of swallow screening, published in 2000. Of course, Dr. Martino was one of several researchers who went on to develop swallow screening methods, along with Dr. Peter Belavsky, the late Dr. Stephen Leder, and Dr. Perry Clave. The early 2000s also saw calls from people like Dr. Logeman for us to adopt best practice methods to raise the quality of dysphagia treatment outcomes research using clinical trials methodology. And of course, in 2008, Drs. Logeman and Robbins published the results from Protocol 201, a large randomized trial exploring the impact of thickened liquids on aspiration in people with dementia or Parkinson's disease. Protocol 201 was hugely instrumental in raising questions about the efficacy of texture modification as an intervention. And this led to the establishment of ITSI and our work to promote an international system of common terminology, descriptors, and measurement for foods and liquids used in dysphagia management. Dr. Robin's work on clinical trials also fostered work on the development of scales to measure quality of life and dysphagia-related burden by scientists, including Dr. Colleen McHorney, Dr. Renee Speyer, Dr. Samantha Shun, and Dr. Ashwini Namasivayam McDonald. And Dr. Robin's work on age-related changes in the swallowing musculature has influenced researchers, including Dr. Nadine Connor, Dr. Emily Plowman, Dr. Georgia Malandraki, Dr. Michelle Chucci, Dr. Kate Hutchison, Dr. Michelle Troche, Dr. Nicole Rogas Puglia, and others to embark on further studies of exercise-based intervention and neuroplasticity, including translational work in animal models and work in patients with head and neck cancer in addition to those with neurogenic dysphagia. And honestly, that's all I could fit on a single slide, but it's really just a tiny snapshot of the enormous explosion of dysphagia research that we have seen over the past 20 years and I acknowledge here that this is a very North American timeline and omits important developments in dysphagia research from places like Japan and Latin America. Some of the themes I was not able to capture on the historical timeline include novel methods of assessment and measurement with technologies like high-resolution manometry, the use of electrical stimulation and neuromodulation techniques as interventions, a growing focus on respiratory swallow interactions, both in adults where cough reflex testing and cough training are topics of interest, and in pediatrics. And of course, as we have seen over the past 18 months, there has been a huge growing interest in telehealth and in the effects of critical care and mechanical ventilation on swallowing, especially related to the COVID-19 pandemic. If one steps back and takes a long-term view of peer-reviewed indexed publications with keywords or title abstract words of dysphagia or deglutition, you can see that our field has experienced a huge 
13.6 fold increase from 343 papers published in 1983 to 4,659 in the year 2020. So how does this make you feel? On the one hand, you may be feeling a bit overwhelmed and you might be wondering how it could ever be possible for someone to stay on top of all of those articles that are published about dysphagia. On the other hand, you might be saying, wow, this is so amazing. I really want to get involved. How can I sign up today? And it's certainly true that even though we have seen such a huge proliferation of dysphagia research, especially in the last decade, that there are still plenty of questions to explore. So this brings us to discussing the steps that are involved in pursuing a research question. And it might surprise you to learn that very frequently, the research questions that we end up pursuing are not in fact the ones that we imagined we would be studying at the outset. For example, when I started my doctoral studies, I thought that I would do a randomized control trial of a rehabilitative dysphagia intervention and change the world for people with dysphagia. But as I dug into reading and understanding our literature, I quickly realized that we were not ready for that question, that there were building blocks that needed to be put in place first. And so I found myself studying tongue movements in swallowing. So if you're considering embarking on dysphagia research, the best place to start is with a general idea or a general question but to keep an open mind about exactly what you may end up doing. And your day-to-day -day frustrations or challenges as a clinician are a great place to look to build those initial questions. The next step is to dive into the literature to understand what is already known and to identify gaps in knowledge that need to be filled. And we'll come back to the topic of reviewing the literature a little later in this talk. Once you have identified a knowledge gap or a research question that you want to study, then the next step is to decide on the research design. And this leads us into a discussion of levels of evidence. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with pyramids like the one shown on the screen that represent the different levels of evidence in our scientific literature but it is always worth reviewing these. And in particular, remembering that expert opinion is the weakest sort of evidence, right at the very bottom of the pyramid. And where do we find expert opinion? Well, in all sorts of places. We can find it in lectures at conferences like the one I'm giving today, in textbooks, in editorial or opinion articles, even in premier journals, in blogs, podcasts, and on social media, and also in narrative reviews where the methods used to search the literature may not have been systematic. Moving up the pyramid, the next three categories of evidence all involve the analysis of data collected from participants, but there are different degrees of scientific rigor and control involved. Three of the key questions that determine the strength of evidence in these types of research designs involve the sample size, that is, how many participants were enrolled in the study, whether or not those participants were randomized to a condition such that there is a comparison between an experimental condition and some sort of control, and whether or not the people who interpreted the data to determine the study outcomes were blinded to that randomization or to other factors that may introduce bias. Additionally, the information arising in reports from these studies is interpreted by the researchers themselves, and even though the articles have undergone some sort of peer review in order to be published, that level of review is not the same as a review where study quality and risk of bias are systematically appraised by others. So these types of studies are considered unfiltered information. When it comes to evaluating the strength of our dysphagia literature overall, this is a place where we typically do not get a very good grade. And it's important for us to remember that non-controlled designs like case studies or small case series 
do have an important place in our literature. And if those studies are carefully performed and rigorously reported, they can still add huge value, but they are generally considered to be relatively weak in terms of their level of evidence. So it's all very well to criticize our field or any other field by pointing out that we do not have a lot of randomized control trials. But it's also really important to stop and think about the assumptions of randomized clinical trials and to ask how feasible it is to conduct these kinds of studies in dysphagia rehabilitation. And this slide summarizes some key assumptions of randomized controlled trials. First, these studies assume that all participants enrolled in the study are similar at the baseline and that they have an equal chance of responding well to the intervention or of not responding to the intervention. A second key assumption is that the experimental condition is different from the control condition. And the third assumption is that the primary outcome measure will accurately capture response or lack of response. So let's walk through a hypothetical, but I hope realistic scenario regarding a randomized control trial that might be proposed for people with dysphagia. Here, I am using a common approach to describing the key elements of a study known as a PICO question, in which we identify the target patient population or problem, the experimental intervention, the comparison or control condition, and the outcome measure that will be used. Here I have selected people with dysphagia following stroke as the target population. And because one of my personal pet peeves is the fact that many studies seem to assume that every stroke patient with dysphagia will have the same presentation, I've added some additional details to focus the study on people who are within three months of their first ever supratentorial ischemic stroke and who are known to aspirate on thin liquids. In terms of the experimental interventions of interest, I have selected the use of mildly thick liquids as the experimental condition and have selected continued drinking of thin liquids in the form of a free water protocol as the comparison or control condition. The point here is that in one condition, we would expect aspiration to be reduced and in the other, we might expect the opposite. So let's stop for a minute and inspect these elements and ask ourselves whether they conform to the assumptions of a randomized control trial. Do you agree that all participants who meet these stated eligibility criteria are likely to be similar at baseline and to have an equal chance of responding well to the intervention or of not responding to the intervention? there are probably several things that could challenge or threaten that assumption. First, even though we have specified that these people have all had a first ever supratentorial stroke, it's quite possible that their swallowing function might look different based on the site of the stroke, the specific brain areas that were impacted, and the size of the stroke lesion. Second, even though we have stated that they must all be within three months of onset, there could well be differences between those who enter the study early versus those who enter later. And third, even though we have stated an expectation that these individuals all share the same problem of aspirating on thin liquids, we have not specified any further details about that. For example, we might specify that participants would qualify to participate in the study by displaying a penetration aspiration scale of six or worse, on at least one five milliliter bolus of thin liquid barium across three repeated boluses performed without a cue from the clinician. And then of course the question is, how easy would it be to find a group of people who meet all of those criteria? The issue is further complicated by the primary outcome measure that I have proposed, which is whether or not the person develops pneumonia during the course of the study. The selection of this outcome measure implies that we think there is a direct connection between aspirating thin liquids, in this case, the free water protocol, and the development of pneumonia. And based on the available literature, there are certainly some problems with that assumption. 
There could be several other reasons why a stroke patient might develop pneumonia related to factors like their mobility, their overall health status, their respiratory status and history, and other considerations. Unless the study sample is large enough to include at least some expected occurrences of pneumonia, then there's a real risk that there will be no difference between the two groups in this study. In order to show a clear and credible statistical effect in this study, one would need to see significantly more patients develop pneumonia in one group versus the other. And depending on the background probability of a person developing post-stroke pneumonia, that might require a very large number of participants. So I hope that example helps to illustrate some of the challenges that exist in doing randomized control trials in dysphagia research. And a number of other very real challenges have made it difficult for us to build a large body of strong clinical trial evidence regarding dysphagia interventions. These include the fact that we currently still do not have clear diagnostic criteria for dysphagia. Also, patients who have the same medical diagnosis may not all show the same swallowing physiology or impairment. There's a very real challenge in that large samples of similar patients are very difficult to find. And related to this, aspiration as a problem of interest does not have a single underlying mechanism of impairment. To add to that, aspiration even within a single person can be inconsistent and task dependent. So it may take many swallows or many boluses to be confident that you have caught the problem. Many of the interventions that we are interested in studying are behavioral in nature and they require compliance. And finally, in populations like stroke, spontaneous recovery may be a confounding factor that makes it very difficult for us to clearly decide whether an intervention has been effective. So looking back at the levels of evidence pyramid, I would say that it's really not surprising that we don't have a large number of adequately powered randomized control trials in the dysphagia literature because our patients are often heterogeneous and it is difficult to achieve compliance and adherence with behavioral interventions. Randomized control trials are simply very difficult to do well. And I would actually say that if you find yourself reading an article in the dysphagia literature that claims to have done a randomized controlled trial in people with dysphagia and reports a statistically significant outcome, your first reaction should be to be very skeptical. And you should analyze that study very carefully to appraise the quality of evidence. If we look at the top of this evidence pyramid, we see three levels of evidence that are considered stronger. And the key thing that these three levels share is the fact that the evidence has been filtered, meaning that a scientist, or more commonly a group of scientists, have critically appraised studies performed by other people to form conclusions regarding their findings and results. Over the past 20 years, there have been huge changes in the world of literature reviews, and I'm hoping you have already heard of the PRISMA Guideline and Checklist, which is an international consensus standard about the methods that should be used for systematic reviews. And the PRISMA Guidelines also include templates for flow diagrams that should be used to report the different steps that have taken place during a systematic review. And because systematic reviews have become such a popular activity, especially for students, I want to share a few tips and thoughts with you that will hopefully make this a more successful experience for you. The first thing to do is to decide on the type of review that you want to do. Systematic reviews focus directly on a very specific question, but you may discover that it is actually more appropriate to start with a scoping review, which is broader and may synthesize themes on a topic from the literature. The next step is to check to see if the review has already been done by somebody else. In other words, you need to do a review of reviews, 
that are already published or in process. And here, a resource that you may want to explore is Prospero, which is an international registry of systematic reviews. And if you find that your question is not yet registered, then you may want to consider registering your own project with Prospero. Another important early step is to meet with a librarian to discuss your research questions and design a search strategy. Once you have come up with a preliminary set of search terms, it is helpful if the librarian can help run an initial search so you have a sense of how many articles you might need to screen. This is a place where additional search terms or filters can be added to narrow the search and produce a more manageable set of articles. Another thing to check here is whether your search has identified articles that you would expect it to find. And this scenario actually happened to us back in 2013, 2014, when we were doing a systematic review for ITSI, looking at how swallowing physiology is impacted by food and liquid consistency. There's a whole body of articles that we expected to find in our search, all published in the Journal of Texture Studies. So we were surprised when none of those articles appeared. When we looked into the issue, we discovered that the search engines we were using did not include that journal, and we had to actually go to a different strategy of manually searching through the tables of contents for that particular journal over the time period that we wanted to study. And finally here, I want to encourage you to refine your search questions, but not too far. Systematic reviews are an ideal tool for identifying gaps in knowledge and literature. But I've sat in an audience and listened to heartbreaking presentations where students have described their questions, their search strategy, and the many, many hours spent screening articles for inclusion, only to end up with a final result of zero papers addressing the topic of interest. When we do systematic reviews, our goal is to synthesize evidence across several studies and come up with an overall conclusion across the available studies in the literature. And very commonly, this involves meta-analysis, where the data from several studies are actually pooled to provide new estimates of effect size. For example, on this slide, I'm showing a meta-analysis from a poster that Dr. Mankox presented at the Dysphagia Research Society in 2019. And here you can see that she has cited seven studies where measures of maximum expiratory pressure were reported after a course of EMST. And you can also see that all of the results fall on the left side of that zero line on the graph. And this shows that there was a significant improvement in maximum expiratory pressures after the intervention. Now, this sort of analysis and output is very commonly included in systematic reviews. But these tables often mask the fact that the studies that are included may not all have measured things in exactly the same way, or there may be differences in the way the studies were performed that mean that their results should not be compared. Checking for study quality, rigor, and risk of bias is an absolutely critical step in systematic review and prior to meta-analysis. If we don't evaluate these elements carefully, there is a very strong risk that we will end up interpreting results as significant and meaningful when the opposite is actually true. So this gives me an opportunity to announce to you as the very first audience, the release of a new public domain tool for evaluating the rigor and transparency of dysphagia research studies. The STARTED framework, which stands for Standards for Rigor and Transparency in Dysphagia Research, has been developed over the past year as a collaboration across six dysphagia research labs, including my own. The tool involves a series of questions that can be used to help evaluate rigor and transparency for a variety of different dysphagia research designs using a variety of different measurement techniques. And we really hope that the tool will be useful not only in the task of literature review, but also for helping researchers to plan their studies and for manuscript reviewers to use when evaluating articles for publication. Please go to the website shown on the slide and feel free to take a look. We also will be collecting feedback from people regarding the tool, so please consider giving it a test drive.
So this leads me into a discussion of threats and opportunities that we face in dysphagia research today. And I'd like to draw your attention to this excellent article from 2016, where Drs. Chuchi, Jones, Malandraki, and Hutchison offered their thoughts about where we might be headed as a field over the next 20 years. In that article, Chuchi and colleagues identified several building blocks that represent opportunities for exciting growth in our field. First, in the domain of basic science, they pointed to our growing understanding of swallowing neurophysiology and to new insights regarding sensory, motor, and coordinative mechanisms that we are gaining, particularly due to advances in imaging technology. In the domain of clinical non-instrumental swallowing assessment, Chu Chi and colleagues pointed to standardization and validation being important developments for refining and improving our practice and to the potential of new adjunct methods such as cough reflex testing to enhance our diagnostic methods. With respect to instrumental assessments, they pointed to the fact that we have not yet achieved consensus regarding a core set of measures that capture key information regarding dysphagia presence, severity, and pathophysiology, and to the impact of new instrumental techniques like high-resolution manometry to help us identify key biomarkers of swallowing impairment. Additionally, they pointed to increased activity in medical science with respect to the development of automated algorithm-based methods for monitoring behavior and identifying impairment, and a growing interest in assembling big data sets to be used in training those algorithms to function optimally. And finally, in the domain of intervention, Chuchi and colleagues identified several developments that have potential to shape our field, beginning with standardization of diet texture terminology through the worldwide adoption of the IDSI framework, a continuing emphasis on measuring the effects of targeted interventions, including targeted neuromodulation, the possibility of developing personalized treatments, either with preventive or regenerative potential, and the development of remote treatment through telehealth, which has become so important in this COVID-19 pandemic. So in thinking about these opportunities, it is also a good time for us to reflect on the various challenges or threats that exist and which need collective problem solving as we chart our way forward as a field. I like to think of these as tensions that exist or issues where we may find ourselves pursuing competing or conflicting directions like a tug of war. And the first of these issues for me is the fact that we do not have consensus in our field regarding the definition or the diagnostic criteria for dysphagia. Some of us define dysphagia as a swallowing difficulty that is experienced and reported by a patient. Others of us define dysphagia as abnormalities or differences in swallowing physiology seen on a particular type of instrumental assessment, like a video fluoroscopy. But here, standardization in assessment protocols and an understanding of the variability that exists in healthy swallowing are absolutely essential before we can confidently identify differences in our patients. A serious limitation that is common in our literature is a reliance on and overuse of imprecise measures. And here there are a couple of trends that I think deserve particular attention and represent opportunities for improvement. The first is the use of tools in ways that were not originally intended at the time of tool development and validation. And probably the most common example is the use of patient-reported symptom scales like the EAT-10 to measure outcomes rather than being used as screening or case-finding tools. The limitation lies in the fact that even when we understand a tool to be valid for differentiating people into groups of those with or without a swallowing problem that requires assessment, the validation studies that were performed did not explore whether these tools were also sensitive to change. A second practice that is common in our literature is the use of non-instrumental measures to capture change when more precise instrumental methods are available. In my opinion, undesirable leaps of interpretation exist when we begin by validating a non-instrumented measure with video fluoroscopy 
demonstrate that it has reasonable but not perfect sensitivity and specificity as a proxy measure for a problem of interest like aspiration, and then use it as the basis for measuring the occurrence of that problem in a subsequent study. Proxy measures are always less precise than the criterion reference measures that are used to validate them. And when there are opportunities to obtain more precise measurement, I believe we should push for those better measures. And COVID-19 provides an opportunity for an analogy here. When we encounter people sneezing or coughing in public these days, we immediately jump to the conclusion that they may be spreading COVID-19. And we quickly distance ourselves and send glares of disapproval, especially if that person is not wearing a mask. But there could be other explanations. Unfortunately, we all now know too well that the presence or absence of symptoms cannot be presumed to accurately represent COVID-19 status. Similarly, in this swallow screening video, although it is highly suggestive, we do not know for certain whether the cough at the end indicates aspiration. When research shows us that non-instrumental assessment methods have less than perfect sensitivity or specificity, it is incumbent on us to use more precise measures in research or at minimum to acknowledge the margin of error that may exist when proxy measures are used. When it comes to choosing outcomes as a field, I believe we have serious work to do in shifting the focus away from aspiration and pneumonia. Dysphagia involves much more than aspiration, and it is unrealistic and inappropriate to suggest that all dysphagia interventions should be expected to alter aspiration rates, let alone pneumonia. Aspiration may go undetected. Both our clinical and research protocols may fall short in terms of challenging the system adequately to reveal aspiration, and our measures of penetration aspiration typically ignore both the amount of material that is aspirated and the frequency with which the problem occurs. Additionally, both our studies and assessments fail to adequately recognize that aspiration does not always lead to pneumonia and that other factors related to immunity, frailty, mobility, independence for activities of daily living, and oral hygiene can play critical roles in determining whether or not a person develops a respiratory infection. In other words, whether or not an intervention effectively reduces aspiration during swallowing may not be a good indication of pneumonia risk. It is time for us to challenge the prevailing opinion that the effectiveness of dysphagia management equates to pneumonia prevention. And finally, we have a huge opportunity to improve the rigor, transparency, and replicability of dysphagia research. It is time for us to adopt guidelines regarding minimum standards for reporting like the started framework. We might also encourage the submission of well-described case studies or case series because we may well learn more from trends seen across patients where similar mechanisms of impairment have been targeted with similar treatment methods than we will from large randomized control trials where variability and differences across heterogeneous patients in a sample obscure or dilute the evidence of effect. I believe it would also be helpful to encourage the publication of well-designed and rigorously described cases where treatment does not lead to change, and to encourage replication studies to solidify our collective understanding of outcomes that can be expected. Although there's a lot of attraction in the idea of building big data sets and in training machine learning algorithms to help us in our dysphagia screening and assessment, it is critical that we ensure similarity across studies before we pool data. Without such checks and balances, there is a serious risk that we will reach erroneous and misleading conclusions. In closing, I want to summarize by suggesting that the top priorities for advancing dysphagia research include establishing consensus on the definition of and the diagnostic criteria for dysphagia, setting standards for rigor and transparency like those evaluated in the new started framework tool, developing consensus regarding core outcome sets, 
and digging beneath the surface of outwardly visible clinical signs and insisting on precise measurement wherever possible. Once again, I thank you for the invitation to speak and I thank you for listening and look forward to your questions.